grace, all through grace. Five verses. Every once there.
always mispronounce her name. Raleigh. Raleigh, Raleigh, North, Raleigh, Carolina. Yeah, Raleigh North Carolina. And I want to say, I want to say Riley, but I can mispronounce a lot of things. Now, I wish his sister was an English teacher and I get corrected a lot of them. Just the way I am. <laughs> Don Trader, you can come up and this. <laughs> the old rugged cross ever reverse.
<laughs> and I was kind of like the old cat laying out in the pasture with his ears down. Leave me alone. Just leave me alone. That's all I wanted. It's so good to be back. Marianne, thank you so much. And yeah. yeah, thank you. I do. Thank you. I've said, I hope this week we'll kind of get back to normal. By the way, we didn't get to do October birthdays last week, so we probably didn't do that. Can you play a little happy birthday on her? <laughs> we can. <laughs> I tell you what, who, uh, who had a birthday in October? How <laughs> 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 many anniversaries in October? Yeah. Oh my gosh, the old house Yeah. Not yet. Gail, did you? Yeah, he said we did. I said not yet. <laughs> Dale, there's a flower store over in the garden. They've always got them made up. Last week, I did. And believe it or not, I went in there about this Wednesday and bought my bubble wife a little bouquet for just putting up with me. Oh, that's nice guy. Probably needed a big bouquet. She did. Yeah. Yeah. She needed a big bouquet for that. Well, I, mean, I couldn't afford it. <laughs> But anyway, it's good to see everybody. I talked to Kenny Gunkel just moments ago before I got here. He's going to get released today. He said that his knee, he thinks, is sore than the last time he had a knee surgery, but he's doing good. I was going to call Robert when I got here. My phone didn't work, but has anybody heard of Robert? Yeah, he had been sick from his Vera had the corona and, and Robert's been sick with his he's chemo. And, but he's good. Yeah, just remember both of them. And all the others that's ill. And, and uh, um, good friend of ours that, that furnished the coat out here for Cowboy Days twice, Jim Birdwell. Uh, if you don't know Jim, he, he is a, one of my dearest. And he's probably the number one auctioneer in the United States as far as purebred cattle and horses. And uh, they diagnosed him with non-Hoskins pneumonia. He will sell his last auction the 17th of this month, and he's going to start some sort of treatment. Boots can. I know Boots is a couple days ago. Boots is even diagnosed with pneumonia. Uh, Larry too. Some of you know Larry uh, Benicia, pretty bad, he's really good. And uh, then the Roman Spencer family, we lost one of them, and that was all this, you know, this was good. And remember all those families. Let's stand to the flag, and folks, uh, we're going to have to vote next week because we're going to vote next week. One of the greatest privileges we have as a free nation. Let's look at that. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Well, in the spirit of the Father, God, thank you for this nation, Lord, and thank you for so many privileges that we get. Privilege to come to church today, Lord, and privilege to serve my flag, and privilege to vote in Privilege to just be here, Lord, in the United States. God be with these ones that we mentioned as they go through the trials and even if they go through the Lord, just give them strength and courage to make them. God be with these families and solve some problems. Thank you for so many great things. And we pray in the great house. Amen. Here's Dr. Dale.
reinforcement of Lolly as she was singing this morning. She was beating time to the music on her back. My mom used to pat my back too, but a little bit lower than that. <laughs> so I don't know about that, but Lolly, thank you very much, honey. Nice to get the praise band out in the audience. Looks like a lot of folks came. <laughs> I was thrilled yesterday. We knew that there was a parade going on in Apache and Elgin and Fletcher, and I was so thrilled to see a gray horse going down the street with Billy on. I thought, yeah, praise the Lord. It was good to see that happening yesterday. It's good to see folk here that have been ill that are back with this morning. I know my daughter's been very sick for a couple of weeks. It's just good to have her here. Jim and Jean went through it, and so many of you out here are attached to this thing. Something more than chasing to your big old swallow of it. So I'm glad you're with us this morning now. Read Revelation chapter 12, and if you're thinking about turning there, the Christian uh, Ranchman uh, newspaper is on the table back yonder. Uh, take one home with you. We get these every month. We get a new paper. Uh, they look very much alike, so maybe you think we've already got one of those, but they come out every month. And uh, take one home with you. Uh, it's got some good stories about the same kind of thing. People have been saved. A lot of them have been in jail or something of that sort. But uh, take them home and, and get to enjoy these stories with you. Chapter 12 in the book of Revelation. Chapter 12. And the whole thing changed at this point. We've gone into the introductory part of Revelation. And now suddenly it centers in the real thing that's going to happen. We're going to see a woman uh, and a dragon trying to consume a child born of that woman. Uh, this would be Israel and Jesus Christ. Uh, and through the whole book from here on out now, it's going to be Israel and Jesus, particularly Jesus Christ, and the attempt of Satan, whoever he's seen by, the red dragon, or whether seen by the uh, serpent, the same person, God tells us in the same book called Revelation, the serpent and the red dragon, the same person, the beast out of the sea, the beast out of the earth, uh, the point is always this. In every case, they're always against Jesus Christ. That's the whole story. That's why it's the revelation of Jesus Christ, it's not the revelation of man that's the false prophet or the beast out of the water or beast out of the uh, on the earth. It's always Jesus Christ being fought against. You'll see that very strongly this morning hour as we look in chapter 12 in the book of Revelation. So I trust you'll Keep that in mind. This is not a book of revelations. It's one. It's about Jesus Christ. And on the part on the other side of it, he gets very strong at this part here. It's Satan's hating his guts. He's a phrase we use here among ourselves. If you do everything you can to destroy uh, this one called Jesus Christ. But we'll just go to the Bible chapter 12 and go down through it and look at it a little bit at a time and uh, get that theme going in our hearts and lives. Let's pray together this morning and then let's take a look at this particular chapter God has for us. Father, I thank you so much for these wonderful people that have dared to be out in a very treacherous day and age in America. I thank you for the wonderful praise band and how they have loved you and served you and many have come and served and practiced and saved, served you and work here at a Christ themselves. And I pray that you'll just bless them for paying that price and Use them greatly for it. And folks that are here are kind of a little bit shaky about the disease and how much we should have of uh, community get-together, social get-togethers, and so forth. But thank you for those who are here. May they really get something from the Word of God that they can take home with them. They'll say, yes, it's good for to be here. Yes, I got something for my heart, my life, uh, my spirit. And may they be here changed and encouraged in the things of Christ because they've been in this particular sharing this morning hour. Thank you for your love, Jesus, by your Holy Spirit. We resist Satan and all the hosts of hell to try to keep us blinded in death to see or to hear what you have for us. In Jesus' name I ask it. Amen. I want to get to this little guy here that's in the book. This one called Jesus Christ. But it starts out by saying, a great sign appeared in heaven. A woman clothed with the sun with the moon under her feet, on her head, a garland of twelve stars. Then, being with the child, she cried out in labor and in pain to give birth. And another sign appeared in heaven. Behold, a great fiery red dragon, 
having seven heads and seven horns and seven diadems on his head. His tail drew a third of the stars of heaven and threw them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman who was ready to give birth to devour her child as soon as it was born. She bore a male child who was to rule all nations and with a rod of iron. Her child was caught up to God in his throne. Now what God has done for you here in these five verses is given the whole scope of redemption from the time that Christ was born to the time that Christ was taken to heaven in the ascension in Acts chapter 1. That's all that's given this whole thing in just five uh, verses of scripture. And she lays on a throne. Hebrews tells us this. He's on a throne praying for us in cowboy church and others that love the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what he's doing right now. Five verses and the whole thing is given to you. That's got a synoptic that's really a great thing for us to understand. She bore a male child to rule all nations. Now, this is not new. If you can think back real quick, it's in back in chapter 2 and verse 4, same thing. This rod of iron. No more hanky-panky. No more fruit around. If God said it, it can be done. Bang! Or is to it. And that will happen during the millennial reign, particularly. No more pussyfoot around at all. This is the age of grace. It's going to stop someday. It will not be under law. But remember the rulership of Jesus Christ, King of kings and Lord of lords. That's just all building up to in this book. That's what's going to happen to us here uh, in, in time to come. Okay, let's take the start in that particular part here. One is you got a child protected. Satan cannot hurt this child that's got this problem going on. Bob to be devoured by the devil. That's the real issue. Satan is against God. God came to us in the form of Jesus Christ. This is called the incarnation. Where God was made flesh and dwelt amongst men here. And Satan who cannot touch God and tried to back in Job. He tried to in other parts of the Bible. Doesn't work. You cannot lick God. No weapon formed against sin ever prospers in any way, shape, or form here. So he takes the child. If I can destroy the child, I'll destroy God for this child. Really is God, and he knew that. And this we'll look at in a few moments uh, later this morning hour. And then there's a place prepared, and he sets a theme up here that goes through the book of Revelation, the rest of the book now, uh, which changed its name in some ways. Who am I? Uh, Brother Bill said that now Dr. Lyon. Well, I like that. That's kind of nice. But there's a girl here called me Daddy, and another girl called me Granddad. And uh, I'm the same character. I've been called other names, by the way. <laughs> but I'm the same guy. The same guy. And so we have in this book numbers. Numbers. And this woman is pursued by the enemy here for 1,260 days. The Jewish people had a 30 day month and they had a 360 day year. And therefore, uh, they say it in different ways. This is three and a half years. A month, two months, and a half a month are three and a half years. And he does this in three different ways, which you'll see through the book if you go through the thing. It's all the same thing. Why change the time the way he says, I don't know. I don't know. But I know that I'm called certain names because of certain roles in my life. You are called certain names because of certain roles in your life. And they all tell a story about us. Why the different numbers? I don't know. Different types of numbers. I don't know that for sure. But they, he, th this fight he has here, you're going to find us to turn from Jesus Christ we looked at this this morning in the Sunday school class uh, we have here. When you can't hurt somebody you're angry at, hurt the person they love. When you can't fight God, fight God's children, because that hurts God's heart. We fight his children there. And so Satan in the book, you can see through the book here now, he starts here in this particular chapter. And you'll find the word then, 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 then throughout the rest of the book here. And Satan cannot hurt God one bit, hurts us. Because of attacking us, hurting us, he in that sense hurts God. And that's what's going to go on here. So the whole book from here on out is Satan trying to kill God. Whatever's going on, whatever happens here, is Satan trying to get against God. And the Lord Jesus Christ saying, you aren't going to get it done. You aren't going to get it done. That's what the book's all about. And no matter whether it's a beast out of the sea or a beast off of the earth or a, a red dragon or whatever it is, it's always that simple battle. It's not some big fancy thing happening here that's going on. So the child is protected. A place is prepared. God has that for it. And then the woman is persecuted. 
I do not believe she is Mary, which some teach very strongly. She is simply Israel. I get that and going back to Joseph in Genesis, Mark the dreams that he had were almost the same picture is given in Genesis with Joseph that's given here about this woman, Israel, with the 12 stars, tribes, about her head. And Satan hates Israel. And I'm surprised that today we have people in this day and age that claim to love Jesus Christ. I won't deny that part of it, but I think they're really against a brick wall. It's called a teacher's replacement theology. Watch those two words, replacement theology, where there are good, sound, fundamental preachers that are teaching that all the things that God said to Israel are thrown away, they belong to the church. No. They still belong to Israel. And they're going to belong to Israel. Israel is going to win. If you're voting in November for Israel, vote for Israel. <laughs> they're going to win their people. I don't care whether they're Republicans or Democrats, but Israel's going to come out on top when the world is all done. They will be on the land of Israel. They'll all be there for sure. You better believe it. But they have men today that are teaching, and these are good men. Good some that they got somehow messed up in this thing called replacement theology, where now the church takes the place of uh, Israel and all the promises to them are ours. No. We are people who are not going to be running Israel's lifetime event. There's no uh, it happened things happen that way. Now, keep it real simple. Well, how does Satan try to do his work? Keep two words in your mind at all times. Number one, Satan wants to assimilate, assimilate God's people. And he's done that again and again and again. One of the greatest pictures of that is Balaam, a false prophet, seeking to curse Israel for Balak, a Moabite king. And he does that by actually sending the women of Moab into the camp of Israel, and it begins to work suddenly to cause Israel to get away from God. And that's always the way Satan works. Get us into the world, then the world into us, so they can't see the difference. On top of that, that's the first thing. Number two, if that doesn't work, he tries to annihilate the people. And you go back, I suppose you go back in the Bible, Genesis 3.15, where God said to Satan, I'm going to put enmity between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed. It'll bruise your head, and you'll bruise his heel. You're going to get a fatal uh, wound to you. He's going to temporary wound to him. And that happened at Calvary's cross. But it's always been the problem, always been the situation, as it tried to work out in God's plan. It just goes through the whole Bible that way. But as Joseph is being blessed by God, the description that comes sounds very much like this description here. This is Israel. And this, it will bring forth the Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ, in the place. And these 12 stars on her head, those are the 12 tribes of Israel. And, and, and this Satan just wants to get rid of her. So that's the woman, I think. And the dragon, God makes it very, very clear, he's also called the serpent. There are verses here that interchange the word back and forth. Very, very simply, serpent, say, a red dragon, red dragon, serpent, do the same thing. He has seven heads. We'll look at that in a moment later. But uh, I, I believe those seven heads refer to this. Satan is trying to wipe out Israel. Like, again, i got a list. Let me see folks right now. So I make a list of where he's trying to wipe up Israel. And he uses this thing called assimilation. Get us all stuck in there if he can. He can't annihilate us, assimilate us here, or do both. But uh, go back in your mind. You can all do this. Number one, Israel was wrapped up in Egypt for years. And they, they kind of ran the whole thing, the whole show. And then they got out of Egypt, and they got wrapped up, especially in northern Israel, uh, the ten kingdoms up there, ten tribes up there with Assyria. And Assyria finally captured them and took them into full-time captivity. And then down below in Judah, they got captured by Babylonia. And this began to be the place that ruled in their parcel. And the pan was always what Alexander the Great made very clear to us. He did several things. As a wise, wise person, you're a fool in many ways, you take people captured and you take them out of their country, out of their familiar place, out of the place of their regular speech and language like that, and make them learn a different, that'll change their mind, believe it or not. Because language deals with their minds. 
It describes things. And then you do deliberately change the language. Alexander made the great part of the world speak Greek and did not know that he was going to be used by God in doing that because, because much of the world spoke Greek. Paul could go all over most of the known world and preach the gospel because they all spoke what? Greek. And Rome was used of God the same way. Rome did world. Every road leads to yeah, so we had all made set up for by God. The, the devil does the thing, God overrules the thing again again. But anyhow, Egypt, Assyria, Babylonia, and then to Babylonia under Cyrus, who told the Jews they could go back home now after seven years of captivity, number four along the line here, and then Darius, also a Persian king, and they backed him up in that particular rulership. Then later on with Alexander came Greece, uh, with the Jewish people here, and then Rome itself. And there they kind of died out at that particular point. That six that have had it. Number seven, I have no idea. <laughs> I don't know the no idea about that at all in any shape or form. Uh, can I do some foolishness with you? And uh, that's what other prophetic speakers do. They give you their, their stern, here's what's going to happen next, you know, here's what's going to be the person next, like that. Let's suppose uh, that it's the uh, Islamic Empire. They have said that they're going to rule America by a simple factor. They're going to have more children than we who pronounce abortions and plan family parenthood and then their children very quietly without a shot being fired will grow up and blow you out. That's America. Also be the whole world that way. You watched England recently? Much how subtly there's so many in that category over there. Ruled by the Muslim caliphs or ruled by Islamic sultans. And he's not a Muslim we know of, but a ruled, ruled by an Adolf Hitler. Somebody, because you think that they are called of God, but have the pure Aryan race. Of course, you know by this time that we white people are all the superior race, aren't we? That's called in Greek, baloney. <laughs> it is. But we have that crazy idea, dear people. But we're no greater than they are. They are these pagan religions. I think I've lived long enough, I've been in enough of parts of the country, I've been some fantastically intelligent people that aren't white. They could be what we call redskins. They may be black. I even learned to be black. I was eating supper with a uh, pastor in Sweetwater, Tennessee. And his wife came in about that time, and Butch was working on the supper time. His wife was out calling, putting on people. He's a pastor there. And she said, uh, Butch, Butch said, How come you're late? Where have you been? And she said, Quite, I've been down from the new neighbors who just moved in here all. And then Butch said, this, Butch said, What color are they? And she said, Black like us. Butch said, What do you mean black like us? And he said, go get a mirror, Mary Ann. That was her name, by the way. Sorry. <laughs> but uh, go get a mirror. And so she had a mirror and brought it back. And she said, what do you need a mirror for? She said, what color are you, Mary Ann? She said, black like you. He said, no, you're not. She said, there are three kinds of us Negroes. These are blacks. And he said, there are browns. And there are yellows. And he said, Dale, I want you to understand, you think the whites and blacks have a problem. You ought to try the blacks and yellows. They got problems too. And this goes on again and again, uh, this thing happened. Why have we got this pure people? I wanted to say that to say this. I've met some fantastic, brilliant black people. And I have some wonderful, tremendous, dynamic Indian people who are just tremendous. In fact, for years, I tried to prove that I was an Indian. <laughs> I did. I have researched it, I think we research it with me. Uh, we've gone through all the files in Pennsylvania, if you need it or not. And we've done all kind of physiological things to see if I act like an Indian, look like an Indian. I was sent by Bill David out in Arizona a few years ago, who was a Navajo Indian pastor. And I said, uh, I think we're kind of alike. And Bill said, not a bit white man. Look <laughs> 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 at his hand in my hand. On the thing like that. Tremendous men of God and people of God. Of course, who took the peanut and made it what it is today? Do you with me yet? 
the white race, no. If I were dying and needed a blood transfusion, I could take it from any colored person of any kind in the world. We are all of one blood God said. Don't you forget that. So that's why it tries to divide the world in, in this particular situation that's going on here. So I don't know about this seventh king, but somebody keep about mine, but the Muslims have said, they have said that they can win America by simply raising children. Take your time, not a shot of fire, and vote us out. See, Satan likes to take it just simply get us to kill our babies by the millions. By the millions. Okay, here we go. The dragon. And I look at this dragon, she burst back. She bore a male child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron. Her child was caught up to God and his throne. But this child, as he's about to be born, this dragon sits in front of her, ready to devour, verse 4, the child. And this is a book about Jesus. And I want to see him. And I realize that this fight described here does not describe one incident. Sometimes take time and study the almost death experiences of Jesus Christ. Go back with me. Go back with me. Mary goes to visit her cousin, Elizabeth. And while she's gone, she becomes pregnant by the Holy Spirit. I'm oh, sorry. She becomes pregnant by the Holy Spirit. Goes and visits her cousin, Elizabeth. She comes back, quote, home, unquote, to her betrothed husband, Joseph, and he sees she's with child, and he's minded to put her away. One of two ways. He could divorce her, or he could have her stoned. Those are the two ways that God had in mind for dealing with a person in sin. And that's back in Deuteronomy chapter 22, where that's found. Had Joseph stoned her to death, or had men stoned her to death, who else would have died? Are you with me? Number two, gals, stick with the others, okay? They're nine months pregnant. They're going to Jerusalem from Nazareth. That is just under, I think about 94 miles. It's just under 100 miles to get from Nazareth to Jerusalem. You're going to walk that journey. You are nine months pregnant. People, there's no donkey. There's no donkey in the book. Where that donkey came from, I must have come out of the woods and said, do you let me carry it down here, please? I don't know where he came from. It. He's not in the Bible. We put a lot of things there that aren't there at all. So she's walking a hundred miles in what was at that particular point, robber infested territory, and not many quality inns on the way. Wanna try it, girls? Nine months? I don't think so. I even a great opportunity for Satan to anything Aborted, not aborted, sorry, miscarried that particular time down the road here. He, he gets down there, and I've been a rancher for years with the cattle, and I do keep clean stables. And we do put straw in and bedding in our stables. We're like, you go to the ranch right now, or Melody and Lou have the ranch, and it looks pretty good. Nice concrete floors there, and a lot of sawdust, a lot of money spent, that particular way like that. But there's no stable in the world fit for a baby to be born in. There's too much easy to get disease in the thing. He could have died through that. And she's by herself. Did you read the scripture? And she brought forth her firstborn son and laid him in a manger because there's no room for them in the inn. And her mind took her up in that phrase, they made uh, no room in the inn. Oh, that dirty, rotten innkeeper. No, he's a good guy. He really was. It doesn't say he kept the best room for his people. It says there was no room there. But God said, but well, anyhow, the point about it is she's in a stable and nobody's with her. Read the scriptures. She brought forth a child. Therefore, she did a manger. In the meantime, she cleaned him up. She wrapped him up. She put him in the manger. Where's Joseph? Where's the apothecary? Where's the big boy? I don't know how many women would like to give birth to the child all by themselves. The child could die. It could get in the middle of the court wrapped right on his neck or something like that. You don't need help in a hurry. Could get disease in the stable. I don't know. It was a good place to die. He's now two years old. They're living in Bethlehem, thinking back to Nazareth yet. And the wise men makes Herod understand that there's a 
new king in town. And Herod is very clever, and he's a murderous man. Oh, tell me where he's born. I'd like to go and worship him myself. But God never intended to kill that child. God told the wise men in the dream, don't believe that character. Get out of here. And they left. And Herod wised up that they were gone. So he sent his soldiers to Bethlehem to kill every male child two years and under. The night before it came up, and you'd like to understand. God said, Joseph, wake up. And, and guys and girls, listen to this. I thank God that Mary and Joseph had such a relationship when he said to her, honey, look, get out. God just said to me, get out. And she got out and got out. Then me, I love their oneness that they had, that fellowship. That she knew he was a man of God. God said he's a righteous man. And God was speaking to him in a dream. And, and they get to go immediately. And I can start saying, but Joseph, no, 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 we got to go now. And they left their home. And all they got, they had a donkey this time, by the way. But they had this situation going on. And they're gone. Because they've been there in the morning. They have to be gone for good by the death of a little child going on their own like that. Um, Jesus grows up. He goes to the Mount of uh, Prayer. Uh, he, he's facing uh, God in prayer there. And Satan comes and tempts him. One of the temptations is, he takes Jesus, he wants to, he's going to take him to the top of the steepest thing here in town. And cast yourself down and prove that wonderful scripture that says, he will give his angels charge over thee to keep thee in all thy ways. So let's just do that, okay? If they took out that temple to people, I've seen it. I've seen the spot. He would have been a dead duck. You don't call that thing. So there's another attempt to take this person's life if he can do it whatsoever. Did you ever go to Nazareth? Nazareth is a beautiful little town. It's quite big, bigger than what it was when Jesus was born there, or Jesus lived there, excuse me, in the place. But Nazareth is on the edge of a cliff. Down in Haiti, there's some cliffs in Haiti. And when a foreign nation sought to fight Haiti, the king of Haiti at that time, didn't know how to fight because he did not have enough soldiers to do it. And he did a very clever thing. He took what little army he had, and he called for the bank, I don't know, troop to come and march across this particular rise before the doing stand of this foreigner that they thought was trying to fight war, take over pay. And they marched around. And then he called for next group. Ta -da! And they come around. What well, he did not know, this foreigner, was this. The king had his soldiers in Haiti trained at this point that when they would disappear off this high ground, they would change uniforms. He had no more soldiers. But they would change uniforms. So, ta-da! Ta-da! And then his final thing they did, he took men that loved Haiti. And he said to these men, I'm trained to do it. You march until I try to stop. And by the dozens, they marched over a cliff and died. We have this many troops, and we have this much loyalty. And I want you to know if you ever think of attacking us, our men will fight to the death. Wow. Nazareth is on a cliff. Jesus preaches his first sermon there. And at first they say, oh, my, what wonderful words this man is preaching. And then he kicks them off by preaching truth which goes against their grain. And they came up to the edge of Nazareth on a cliff to push him over the cliff. And somehow, by God's grace, he walks away from that. I'm not at one point. Satan has been from the very beginning attempting to destroy Jesus. And then there are several cases in the Bible. One is in John 10, 31, where he preaches and says, As the Father is, so am I. Makes that very clear in the relationship. And they pick up stones to stone him. One time, two times, several times. And anything they can do to destroy this one called Jesus Christ. Did you ever go to Gethsemane and watch the prayer of Gethsemane? The plan had been, it's way back in Isaiah 52 and Isaiah 53, is going to be the cross. 
the crucifixion of Jesus Christ back there. And as it comes to that point, Jesus goes in his weakness to a prayer life in Gethsemane. And as he's praying in Gethsemane, he sweats, as it were, great drops of blood. Now there's a name for that. And I've been told by medical people I've asked, what happens when a man sweats blood? And the doctors would say, they usually die. This was in a shock condition, they die because of it. And that's why, and only why, he prayed, Father, not my will, but thine be done. He was not afraid of Calvary. But Calvary was not the plan. Calvary is where the nation could see him in light of the people of Israel, of Jerusalem. But Satan wanted him to die all alone, unseen, unobserved, in that little quiet place where I have been. And he prayed, Father, if you change your mind, I'm with you. But by your grace, you don't mind, just get to Calvary, which is the original plan to begin with. But Satan might have killed him there, if he could have. But angels came and ministered to him and took care of him at that time. And then in Matthew 27, he finally got to where and died for our sin. Did you understand? That's ten places where this one called the Red Dragon has always tried to get rid of the deliverer of Israel. That's always been his plan. And what's going on to the rest of the book of Revelation is not a beast out of the sea and a beast out of the sea, out of the, out of the land, but it's a matter of, of Satan fighting Christ. It's the whole picture here. And that's why God just the revelation of Christ. He's going to win in this particular thing. But he will try again. He's not through yet. And that's why Christ will come riding out in Revelation, eventually on a white horse to war against Satan in a place called Armageddon. And Jesus Christ is going to win. The boy in Bona Park said the Armageddon, where the Armageddon fight will come, is the most practical and perfect piece of land for war that we've ever known in history. And that's where they're going to settle it. But I'll tell you, he's going to win right now. I got that all figured out. I read the book, I read the last chapter. And it's going to be Jesus Christ. We can do on that. But this war is not new. If you take your Bibles and go back to, well, it's here. It's here. Let me see. Go look at verse 7 for a minute. War broke out in heaven. Because of this situation going on here, war broke out. Michael and his angels fought with the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought. Back in verse 4, the fights all talked about here, and Michael says, Oh, no, you're not. No, you're not. Uh, to read about Michael, you need to go back and study Daniel, which is a prophetic book, which I'm not getting into at this point in prophecy. But Michael's back there. And several things happen, and you need to know this guy called the person called Michael. He's uh, descriptive title is Michael the Archangel. Now there are several archangels, but he is Michael the Archangel, the defender of his people, the Jewish people here, very, very much. Uh, back in the book of Daniel, Daniel's praying. And he's praying, God, I need an answer to this particular situation. And God says, Gabriel, Gabriel, hey. Go down and answer Daniel's prayer. And Daniel's praying, week one, week two, week three, nothing happening. And suddenly Gabriel shows up. And Gabriel says to Daniel, you're beloved of God, God loves you. You're so faithful. The answer came as you kept on going. I'd have been here earlier except that the prince of Persia. And God begins there to open to our minds this demonic personage in the world today. Because you can find out in Ephesians chapter 6, we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers, against things in heavenly places. You'll find it back here in the book of Daniel, that what's going on here is a satanic battle against the things of God. And God has a message for Daniel, and Satan says, I don't want to get it. And so he sends the prince of Persia. And there are at least a dozen evil spirits in the Bible. And God is showing us here in Daniel and with Michael that there are some that are the bosses, the leaders, the princes of the whole situation. 
If you don't believe in that, try this one, okay? Then we'll go back there in a minute. You come to church on Sunday morning. I'm not going to hurt it. But a teacher or the preacher preaches a dynamic, wonderful sermon. And you're sitting there. And then the sermon's over. And you walk outside and think, I can't remember everything he said. You ever been there? Or you're very, very faithful. You're up at 5 in the morning. You're reading the Bible. Close the book up and go outside the. What was I just reading? You ever been there? Oh, good. I'm glad to hear that. Did you ever read the Bible about the spirit of deafness as an actual name in the New Testament? Spirit of deafness? You that have tried with your family or friends to witness about Jesus Christ, you can quote a drop of a hat, 10 or 20 or 30 scripture verses. You quote very, very simply. And you're with this particular person. You know there's a hunger in their hearts to know Christ is their Lord and Savior to have some spiritual help on some particular field and you start to quote and then they get they go. And you know exactly how to quote it. It goes off real quick and you very really quick like that. Did you ever hear about the spirit of dumbness? Spirit of blindness? Spirit of deafness? Spirit of dumbness? I never take any illness just off the top of my head because God speaks of a spirit of infirmity in the Bible. These are all satanic spirits to people in the Word of God. There's not a dozen named in the Word of God. I'm careful of those. It makes me realize then that God has in his economy, I'm sorry, Satan has in his economy, the fact that there are leaders of nations, Prince of Persia, Daniel also talks about chapter 10, the prince of Grecia, because when Gabriel gave his message to Daniel, he said, I've got to get out of here now, because when I left the prince of Persia, fighting with Michael, who came to get me freedom to go and take this message to you, now the prince of Persia has come, and it's not very easy to battle that way. I'm going to help him out. And they did it, got to a stalemate, and oh, went back to Mary. We all know what happened. It tells us in the Bible. But there are evil powers out there, principles and powers. God calls me Ephesians chapter 6. And God says, you and myself, get your armor on. I don't know if you know Charles Stanley, Dr. Charles Stanley from Dunn, Georgia. But anyhow, he never gets out of bed without putting on the armor of God for his clothing for the day. Six pieces in the book of Ephesians chapter 6. And not one piece for your back. We stand, we stand against the enemy. And that's what's going on here in this particular theme that's here. But uh, Michael is called the prince of the people of Israel. He's called the archangel of God. Daniel 12, but he stands up for the people of Israel. So he's in this chapter here with no surprise whatsoever. And you want to tell you something, he's going to win. He's going to win. That's what the theme of the rest of the book is going to be. Satan versus God, and all these other things are in that same category. You understand? Isn't it simple? I think it is. I don't be selfish. There's a lot of mystery about this part, but anyhow. And so I see these other things the beast out of the sea, and the beast of the earth, and the red dragon. They are just simply satanic ambassadors, ministers, that have one thing in mind destroy Jesus Christ and the work that he's come to earth to do. I think it's a relationship. It's very, very simple to do. I would be prayer, please, would you? Father, thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ. He won. He's still winning. I thank you, God, that when we look at all the things happening in this world, we are on the winning side. Thank you for that. Teach us in this book and maybe be a people walking in victory and not walking as victims because of all the Satan does to us. He will attack us in order to hurt our Father whom he cannot hurt. Bless these people. Take them home safely. Grow them greatly. Use them wonderfully for your honor and your glory. Bless our dear people that are still ill, still sick. Bless those that are suffering from the loss of loved ones, God. Made him rise and yes, Jesus Christ is alive. Yes, he's going to win. 
Yes, we may be in temporary difficulty, but we are on the winning side. Blessed are this end in Jesus' precious name. If there's somebody here that's not on Christ's side, not born again with the Spirit, bring him to that place. In Jesus' name I ask you. Amen. Good morning. God bless you. Pick up a Christian answer on your way out.